Hi everyone, I'm here with Isaiah James. He's back on the show to talk about his campaign. He's running in New York's 9th Congressional District against incumbent Yvette Clark. And a lot has changed since we last talked, Isaiah. So welcome back. Thank you for coming back on. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yeah, um, it's a different world now. The last time since we talked, uh, the Democratic primary was still going on. Remember when that was a thing? Uh, COVID-19 yeah. wasn't a thing. Um, you know, these protests, the murder of George Floyd hasn't happened. Wasn't, it wasn't a thing back then. So, I mean, like, how has your campaign been doing? Give us a little bit of an update and let us know how you've been able to adapt to campaigning in a COVID era when you can't knock on doors and you have to basically change the strategy that you were using. Like, how's everything going? Because June 23rd, next week is the primary. So... We're coming down to it. So how are things currently? So I want to not push back, but correct something you said. We said it's a different world. It's a different world for some, but for some people, they've been living this reality their entire existence. You yeah. know, me as a six foot eight black man, I know what it's like, you know, to look like the suspect when you walk out of the door. My wife has a pre-existing condition. You know, 40 million people are now out of work and out of health care, but 35 million people didn't have health care before this all started. Wages were still low. So it's a different world to those who weren't paying attention. But for millions of people, this is nothing but more than the same. So that's that. Two, our campaign has changed. Everything's online now. It's all digital. You know, like, like we talked before we came on, you were one of the first people to ever give me a platform and interview me and let me speak to people about the campaign I'm running. Because grassroots campaigns, you either have to have a ton of money or you have to have a ton of momentum. We don't have a ton of money, but we have the momentum. So all of our town halls have switched to online. We can't go out and, uh, and knock on doors. But believe it or not, literally before I got on this interview with you, a potential constituent left me a voicemail and called me. How she got my number, I don't know. But when I called her back, she was so shocked and surprised. She was like, oh my God, you actually called me back. She said she had reached out to the other campaigns and team members and other folks had said they're gonna look into it, but she left me a voicemail and I called her back. I've done that with numerous folks who called me because I'm just an everyday person. So everything we've done, we've done now is online. All of our ads, we're releasing ads literally twice, three times a week on ads and, and digital digital town halls, coming on shows like this and other shows. I was on a few other shows last week. I got a few other shows tomorrow just to get our message out there because my strongest strength as a, as a candidate is getting out there and talking to the people, letting them know that somebody resonates with their problems. But we can't do that now because literally the entire world is shut down. So yeah. we just we've had to, you know, in the military, we had improvise, adapt, and overcome. So we were improvising at first because we were just a grassroots campaign. Now we have to adapt and hopefully on June 23rd, we overcome. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot going on. And I'm glad that you said that um, in the beginning about, you know, this being really the same thing for everyone. Uh, because I think that what a lot of people are realizing now, a lot of white people in, in particular are realizing is that, you know, racism didn't go away. People with white privilege like to live in that bubble and think, well, you know, I haven't seen racism. I'm not racist, so it doesn't affect me. But the thing is that racism is a force that is malleable. It's able to adapt. It doesn't just go away, you know, with time if we just ignore it. I mean, if you think about this, like when it goes to slavery, that was abolished. And then we got Jim Crow. Jim Crow went away. And now we functionally have a version of Jim Crow in mass incarceration where we're still able to um, where, where the system is. It has institutions that still disenfranchise mostly black Americans. It denies them th the right to vote. You know, this uh, label of felon on people. I I'm reading the new Jim Crow um, right now, which is a phenomenal book. And it's going through that. all these things. Yeah, yeah it it's it's such a great read. And I'm reading it for the first time. And really, it's, it's eye opening. And, you know, what happens is that everything is cyclical. Like you, you think that things have changed, but in actuality, you know, the forces that really corrupt our system, they just adapt. You know, it's not just racism, capitalism, like it all adapts. So I wanted to get your perspective on this because you said you're a black man in America. You know, you see black men being killed with impunity. The videos are up there. Um, we're now getting reports about possible lynchings with Robert Fuller in California and Malcolm Harsh. How are you able to basically educate people while at the same time, you know, be human because it bogs you down. It wears you down. So how do you how do you deal with this as a black man in America in 2020? Uh, well, you know, when you said that 
a lot of folks don't see racism, so it doesn't affect them. I mean, you don't see gravity, but jump your ass off a building and watch what happens to you. Just because you don't see something doesn't mean it's not there and it's not affecting everybody. And even if you are white, racism affects you because your fellow countrymen and women are being persecuted, number one. Number two, how do I not get it, let it get me down? I mean, I've been black my whole life, so this is all I've known. This is my existence. You know, I know what it's like, like I said, for people to cross the street when they see me, for people to clutch their purse when I walk by, you know, to get followed around stores. So it doesn't it doesn't affect me in that sense as I'm used to it. Sadly, I'm used to it. You know what I mean? And also I'm I'm buoyed by seeing so many people continue to fight. Like as a black man, I'm the seventh generation in this country of crimes committed. From sixteen nineteen when those slaves landed in Jamestown, the the, the strength and, and the heritage that I come from, if my people could make it through whatever they made it through and my particular background is Jamaican. So my folks come from Jamaica. Those were the, some of the worst conditions on the sugar plantations and the tobacco plantations. And if they can make it through that, we can make it through this. And if they didn't give up, if we, I am where I am today because they didn't give up. So in order for us to get the next generation of all Americans and black and brown folks to where we need to be, I can't give up. I understand what I'm fighting for. You know, the greatest tree you can plant is one whose shade you will never sit in. I'm where I am today because somebody sacrificed, somebody sat at that lunch counter in 1963. Somebody got bit by that dog and got that water hose turned on them. Somebody got their head cracked by a police baton marching for rights. That's why I'm sitting here today. And I want to be the last generation to have to deal with this because, like you said, racism isn't out in the open anymore. You know, so instead of burning a cross in front of your yard, they'll put a police car on the corner. They've now taken off their white robes and now they have on black robes and a gavel. So it's the same racism. I like my racism out front and up open. So at least I can see it. I know how to combat it. But so racism has now been it's pervasive. It's mo it moves in the cracks and in the shadows of our government. And that's why we call it systematic racism, because it, it's in housing. It's in education. It's in health care. It's in the military. It's in police. It's in everything. And if you know anything about racism is a cancer, you can't just, you know, cut away a slice of the tumor. You have to excise that entire tumor and remove that cancer from the body or it will metastasize and eat itself. Like every other great empire around the world, the Turks, the Romans, the Greeks, the, the Assyrians, the Ottomans, the Russians, all of them have collapsed because they did not take care of what they needed to take care of internally at the time. And America is headed headlong in that way unless we correct ourselves right now. This is a task that is so huge that it's difficult to even know where to begin. I think that, you know, the thing about racism is that it's it's so embedded in all of our institutions and in culture. White supremacy, it's everywhere. So, you know, people who are privileged, they don't necessarily understand it. So my hope is that, you know, white people in general, they actually wake up. I mean, when we're looking at all of these videos of police brutality, them gassing peaceful protesters, you know, this is really jarring to white people, uh, people that I talk to in my social circles, who they trusted the police. But I mean, this is knowledge that black communities have been privy to since the founding of this country. This isn't a new phenomenon. It's just that white people are learning about the black experience more so. But I think that really what I hope that can come out of this, besides institutional changes, of course, is, you know, a cultural shift to where you, you are not just apathetic or ambivalent. And what I mean by that is, you know, nobody wants to say, oh, well, I'm I'm racist. Of course, you know, nobody thinks that they're racist, even racist. But the difference is you have to go a step beyond that. You can't just be comfortable saying I'm not racist because I have a black friend or a black family member. That's not good enough. And that's not going to do away with racism. It requires more than that. And, you know, it seems like we are on the cusp of a cultural shift. But at the same time, you know, we've been there before where it feels like there would be change. You know, Rodney King, there, there's there's so many instances where it feels like, you know, we're finally going to change, but racism just adapts. So my question to you is, as a black man in America, what would you like to see if you had a magic wand and you could do, um, or actually, let's get into a little bit more concrete scenario. Let's say you win your primary, you're elected to Congress, and you are able to craft legislation that's perfect, that will get passed. What would that look like in your opinion? Because I think that people are branching out, liberals, at least 
some liberals are trying to run away from that instinct to just opt for incremental reform. That's clearly failed. Incrementalism, I think, isn't going to suffice this time. So we're talking about defund the police. We're even entertaining abolitionist arguments. But for you, legislatively speaking, how do you root out racism from the institutions that it's embedded in? Is it is it able to be reformed? Like, what do you, what do we do in terms of like a policy approach to this? Because it's such a huge thing. I don't know where to begin. Okay, so let's unpack a few things that you said there. So when we talk about individuals and being racist, I don't think individuals can be racist, and I'll tell you why. Everybody has a prejudice. We prejudice just means to prejudge. You have a prejudice when you walk into a buffet and you look to see which food you're gonna get because it looks good or that looks bad. That's a prejudge. Racism is a system. And racism is like I said, when I say when I say it's a system, I mean it controls masses. So when we talk about racism in America, I'm not talking about, you know, the 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 Kathy that calls the police or the Karen that doesn't want the black person to barbecue. That's them being prejudiced and ignorant. But the racism comes in to the fact that she can call a police system that she knows will do something or have a, a adverse effect on a black person. That's the system that we need to deal with. Everybody has prejudice. People can be taught and, and learn to get rid of their prejudice. But racism as a system has to be dismantled. You can't reform racism because police have body cameras now. They're still beating people. They're still killing people. They're, they're gassing protesters peaceful protesters on the damn news. So a camera is not the way. You can't retrain them because the system is set up. Policing in this country literally stemmed out of slave catchers who would go and capture escaped slaves and bring them back. So the entire system is corrupt. And if I could craft a perfect piece of legislation, I don't think there is such thing as a perfect piece of legislation because legislation has to evolve with the times of the day. But if I could craft some legislation right now, we need to demilitarize our police. You know, police officers are using the same exact equipment that I used when I was in Afghanistan and Iraq. Like literally this, I could get inside one of those big ass up armored vehicles, flip all the switches, turn it on and move it because I've driven it a million times. They're using the same vehicles in Iraq. Not only that, they have qualified immunity, which allows them, just imagine this. My wife is a teacher. She, in New York City, you get a teaching certificate, a license to teach. Do you think she would be able to be on the job if she had 10 complaints of, of misconduct or 10 complaints of abusing a child? No lawyer could have, you know, 20 years worth of contempt citations against them. They would be disbarred. She would lose her license to teach. No police officer who is a public servant would should be able to allow to, to commit acts of violence against people and be shielded because of this silly ass law on the book. So we need to end qualified immunity. We need to demilitarize that police. We need we need to end broken windows policing in communities of color. A lot of folks like to say, well, black communities have more crimes. They have more crimes because they have more police. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The police officers have to be justified some way, so they arrest people to justify their existence. It's a never-ending cycle that reformation is not going to change. It has to be dismantled. So there's no one perfect piece of legislation, but there are things that we can craft and put into bills. We need to tackle this stuff now. Like right now, New York City just passed an anti-chokehold bill. That's the problem, that you have to pass a bill to tell an institution not to choke people to death. That's that's a summation of the problems in the fact that you have to pass an anti choco bill. How about we we reduce the number of police so we don't so when that money can go to mental health services, that money can go to the, to diversionary programs, that money can go to, to outpatient programs, that money can go to mental health services. So we're not using our police officers and police force as you know. A, a end all to all these other social things that we should be doing. We're not using our jails in lieu of mental health facilities. We're not using police officers as immigration officers, all these other things. And when we talk about police, we don't just have to think about, you know, 911 NYPD. We have to also talk about the Department of Homeland Security. We have to talk about ICE and Im immigration customs and customs enforcement. We have to talk about all these other pseudo quasi police agencies that the state the government has to police people in all forms and fashions. So we don't just need to look at NYPD. We need to look at all of this damn stuff with the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act and all these things.
Yeah, and I'm glad that you said that because I feel like if you just try to reform the existing police as it is, you're not really getting to the root of the problem because it doesn't address the underlying issue that our response as a society has collectively been just to throw more police at whatever the situation is. So rather than addressing the homeless crisis with housing, we just throw more police on it. We, you know, criminalize homelessness. So it, it's like we've had this one default setting to where, oh, there's crime, there's these issues, X, Y, and Z. Well, that just means we increase our police budgets even further. We throw more police at it. And I think that people are starting to wake up and realize this isn't like, it's not acceptable to have a one-size-fits-all solution to all of a city's problems. That doesn't make sense, right? Like, we no. we have to be nuanced. We have to acknowledge the fact that mental health care requires, uh, or mental health crises require mental health care. You know, um, it doesn't require police officers. Domestic violence isn't something that you can solve with policing. These are, these are issues that are complex. And so I, I'm glad that we're actually talking about going beyond reform. It is a little bit frustrating that, you know, you see Democrats such as Joe Biden, Jim Clyburn, try to co-opt the language, say, you know, I don't support defund the police, but I want to reimagine the police. That can mean anything. <laughs> and it's not necessarily, yeah. I mean, it, it might be reimagined to even what maybe his reimagination has given them more money and more power. Joe exactly. Biden did give us the crime bill, so I don't trust Joe Biden on policing at I, all. <laughs> anyone who is part of the problem, who created the you know the issues that we're dealing with, I can't trust them. And, and I'm glad that you brought up chokeholds no. in New York because um, you responded to um, something that Andrew Cuomo said that I wanted to ask you about because this is insane to me. So Andrew Cuomo said, people are still out protesting. You don't need to protest. You won. You won. Uh, you accomplished your goal. Society says you're right. The police need systematic reform. So my question to you is, um, your, resp your response was that basically he ended racism. It's over, guys. As a black man, how yeah. does it feel living in a post-racial America, Isaiah? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's marvelous. When he said that, I was like, what the hell? I was like, that, that right there, again, is a summation of the fact that Andrew Cuomo has never lived a day in the shoes of a black man or a black person or a person of color or any marginalized community. Think about it. Andrew Cuomo's father was governor. His brother hosts a TV show on CNN. He's now governor of New York. He's never lived a day. I don't give a damn how much he tries to, to sympathize or empathize. He doesn't know what he's talking about. People are still protesting because this is not over. You just saw a man get shot in the back running away in, in Georgia or wherever it was a few days ago. You know what I mean? They made the song F the Police in the 80s, and we're still dealing with this stuff now. You know, they were getting dogs and water hoses turned on them in the 50s and 60s. This isn't a new problem, and it's not going to end just because some person in high power says it's over. Nothing has changed. Nobody's defunded the police. Nobody's pulled the police back. We still have a $6 billion budget for the NYPD. $6 billion. Meanwhile, New York State just cut $400 million from public hospitals so he doesn't get the problem he doesn't even get the solution he doesn't get anything he's just trying to placate everybody and give me these nice pat on the backs but that doesn't work with the people you know and protest is supposed to make people uncomfortable if it didn't make people uncomfortable nothing would come of it look at occupy wall street they sat down on the ground they chanted stock market got bigger the rich got richer the poor got poor nothing changed because it didn't make people uncomfortable. You know what? There is no such thing as a peaceful protest. Protest in and of itself is an act of defiance. You show me an act of defiance that's peaceful. You ever tried to pick up a little kid that don't want to be picked up and they let themselves all go all crazy like that? It's still hard to wrangle them. You're using muscle. That's them defying you. Even when Martin Luther King marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, he was marching peacefully but it was the, the violence that Bull Connor did when he started beating people and attacking people that turned the eyes of the nation on this stuff. So black people get arrested every day, get assaulted every day by the police. Just because we don't all get killed, like what happened to brother George Floyd, doesn't mean it's right. It's wrong in every instance, and he doesn't understand that. He's speaking from a, a position of privilege. And, you know, even I have privilege as a, I have male privilege as a man, so... I know about privilege. Everybody has a certain type of privilege. But in this instance, he's speaking from a position of way privilege. that He has absolutely no idea. Tell his, tell his ass to come down here to Crown Heights and just sit in the, sit in a bush somewhere and watch what police officers do to, to young black dudes in the subway. Just just come on down here. I invite him to come down here right now. Let's go to Flatbush or East Flatbush. Let's go to Bed-Stuy or Brownsville. 
Let's go to let's go anywhere around. Let's go up to the Bronx. Let's go anywhere and see what happens for absolutely nothing. Just living in your skin and then tell me that people should get off the streets and go home. Yeah, I, I think that his remarks, it really speaks to this this liberal instinct, the centrist instinct to get everything back to normal, whatever that means. But I mean, uh, I mean, what what is normal? I think you kind of spoke to this in the beginning, like. It, it, it seems abnormal right now to people who have been in positions of privilege. You know, if you have uh, health care, then you're living a pretty normal life. If you don't have to worry about police officers, you know, murdering you at a routine traffic stop, you know, that then this seems abnormal right now. But the thing is that I, I think you really nailed it when you said protests are supposed to be uncomfortable. And the fact that we see lawmakers squirming, trying to find some way to quell the protest, that shows how effective that they are. I mean, it's not just Democrats not to pick on them. I mean, Donald Trump threatened to use the military to crush protests. They don't want these protests to happen, which is all the more reason why they should continue to happen, because they're working. I, I think that, you know, you don't change hearts and minds by retreating. You don't, you know, run away from your values the minute you get a little bit of pushback from Republicans, which is what I'm kind of seeing from lawmakers like Joe Biden, for example, with, you know, defund the police. Oh, that's too radical. No, hold your ground. And if it seems too radical, that just shows how comfortable people are, that they think a slogan like defund the police is radical. Educate people. Try to get through to people who otherwise don't know about the things that are happening, who have white privilege or rich privilege or all types of privilege. Um, so I wanted to um, get to you uh, or ask you a question about you know, more root causes of this system. So you just put out an ad recently that is fantastic, and we'll play that now for people who are watching. Me as a black man in the United States of America, like literally we were the first capital. We were bought and traded as, as pieces to, to add to farm equipment. Capitalism in and of itself cannot sustain itself. It will eat itself. Because when you have a system that extracts so much from so many and concentrate it in the hands of so few, it will collapse. We better wake up and understand that but we have to center all of our policies around poor people and working people and people of color and marginalized communities. Every policy we have, because the rich people don't need any more money. All those gig workers, millions of jobs in the restaurant industry, millions in the hospitality industry, millions of jobs in the service sectors that don't have those protections that have been lost because our country has allowed union membership to be decimated. Those are the millions of people who don't have any protection. Tens of thousands were already dying every year because they didn't have health care. Is there going to be a hospital bed for me if I need it? Is there going to be a ventilator if I need it? Am I going to lose my job if I get sick or I can't go back to work? Capitalism does not care about working people. It damn sure doesn't care about poor people or sick people. It only cares about replicating and making more capital. These are the viruses that still plague our body. There's income inequality and racial adjustments and healthcare care insecurity and housing insecurity and food insecurity. Because once this virus passes, and it will pass, the systems that are in place that are exploiting people right now must be dealt with. But it's going to be up to our generation to get this ball rolling because we cannot rely on the White House. We cannot rely on Republicans. We cannot rely on corporate Democrats. Martin Luther King Jr. said, don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you do, and I'll tell you what you believe. With regard to that ad, the first thing really, it stood out. You said black Americans, they were the first capital in this capitalist system. Their bodies were literally capital. So I'm curious, you know, tying capitalism to all of this, I want to know your take on this. Um, is it possible to change um, policing to to root out racism effectively? I mean, it'll never go away. But I mean, can, can we... Can we change it enough without actually tackling capitalism itself? I'm curious what your take is on this, because you always break things down, you know, so beautifully in a way that's easy to digest. I mean, these are big issues and it's it's kind of tough to wrap your head around it. But what's your take on capitalism's role in all of this? Because I, I feel like it's it's present everywhere and we also have to address this as well. 
Well, well, that's a great question. So, again, no, it's, you can't do it piecemeal. It's systematic. So, like I said in my ad, you know, black people literally were the first capital. You know, the more slaves you owned, the more property you owned, you know, the bigger your plantation could be and so on and so forth, and the richer you could get. So we were the first capital. If we want to, capitalism, it, it, it's, it's, it's a line. It runs through all these things, criminal justice, policing, because if you think about it, for-profit prisons have to make a profit. So they need bodies to fill those prisons. That's where they have, that's where they funnel money to the police forces to make them quasi-military forces to arrest more people, to lock them up, to fill up for-profit prisons. So now all the contractors can provide the beds and the foods and the meals. And then we can, we can get the guards, we can pay the guards now because now they're part of this capitalist system. Oh, this capitalist system that funnels super, super amounts of money into the military industrial complex. Well, we have surplus equipment, so what do we have to do with it? We're going to sell it to other countries to kill their poor people, and we're going to sell it to our police force so we can keep our poor people and our working class people in check. Capitalism, it, it's a vein that runs through all these things. And in my ad, when I say that capitalism doesn't care about poor people and working people, it really doesn't. I mean, if it did, it wouldn't be capitalism. It would be socialism. It cares about making more capital and replicating that. And criminal justice is a big, big business. It's it's, a, it's about the second biggest business. Everybody thinks, you know, it's pharmaceuticals or technology. No, one is the military industrial complex. And then it's criminal justice because it runs the vein through all of that stuff. And if we don't systematically reform or systematically dismantle the, this capitalist system, it's never going to change. I mean, we've been talking about these things for a hundred years, for 200 years. The first slave that said, let me be free, wanted to end capitalism. They didn't like it. So we've been talking about this for hundreds and hundreds of years and we've never, nothing's going to change unless we get a, a, a critical mass of people like me and AOCs and Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan's into office who actually give a damn about the people because they have these lived experiences. Bro, I can go out this door right now as a highly decorated disabled veteran. Medals, ribbons, letters from the president thanking me for my service and my bravery and be shot dead by some damn idiot because my blackness is seen as a threat. That system cannot be reformed. That system has to be dismantled. Yeah. And, and you said something in that ad that also stood out to me. You said capital only cares about replicating and making more capital. And that's so simple. And it's easy to understand. Capitalism is like a virus. Like it has led to the commodification of everything like human lives, you know, are commodified. But this isn't necessarily a new phenomenon. This has been a thing that's happened since the founding of the country and you know these problems like the rate that capitalism is able to replicate it, it's faster than the rate of change which is why we kind of see things getting progressively worse throughout the country why it feels like you know we're not really making change um you know and you think that with time you know progress it is going to head in one direction that change is linear but that's not necessarily true i mean just this week we got the landmark ruling from the supreme court that workplace discrimination against gay and trans people is um outlawed but then days before that donald trump stripped away health care protections for transgender people so it's not like you're just going to move in one direction it's going to take time uh but if we don't actually address the root causes then you know, it's it's going to be undone. So I'm curious because there's so much that needs to be accomplished. What is your, are you feeling at all optimistic because people are out in the streets? Because I think that this hyper focus on electoral politics, while uh, electoral politics is important, I think people are starting to really realize the value in direct action. Do you feel optimistic at all that we actually will, for the first time, even if we fail, at least try to target like these root causes in the system? There is, I don't think there's, there's no such thing as failure. Everything is a lesson. It's an opportunity to learn and to get better. You know, the only time you can fail is when it's over, you're dead. That's when you stop trying. You know what I mean? So I think it, it will get better. It is going to get better. And I'll, and it's because of electoral politics, you know, because I'm running for Congress, but state assembly, your local mayor, your, your, your ombudsman, whatever, those people, when they have to answer to the people, when people start actually making their voices heard, and I give a lot of credit to not just the folks 
who've been doing it for 30, 40 years on the front lines. But I give a lot of credit to Bernie Sanders. He awakened an entire generation of apathetic youth that was not even engaged in social, you know, the social milieu that is American politics. And now that's why you see on the streets black, white, young, old, gay, straight, trans, abled, disabled, differently abled, rich, poor, whatever. Everybody's out there saying, yo, this has to change because Martin Luther King Jr. said it. We may have come here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And America is a big boat. She is the Titanic. And we see the iceberg dead ahead. The iceberg is racial injustice. It's income inequality. It's poverty. It's food insecurity. It's healthcare insecurity and housing insecurity. And if we don't turn this ship that is America right now, we are going to hit it and we are going to sink. And if you know anything about ships, it takes a long time to turn it. So we have to start right now. And I'm so enthused to see so many young people. I say young people like I'm old. I'm 33, but 18 year old, 19 year old, 15. Me and my wife were coming back from somewhere the other day. We saw literally a, a tiny family. Kids couldn't have been no more than eight, nine years old. Single family standing on the corner in one of the richer neighborhoods in my district with Black Lives Matter posters. They're the only ones out there and they were white. But that is the seed that has been planted. And all these seeds that are planted will eventually grow. And like I said before, the shade that the, 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 the youth are going to sit under are the seeds that we're planting right now. It's a daunting task. Yeah, it is. But guess what? It was also a big task to end the system that existed in this country for 200 years that built the country. That system was slavery. It was a daunting task to end the system that kept black people unequal for 100 years. That system was Jim Crow. We fought those things. We ended those things. Now, like we didn't remove the, the cancer all together, like I said before, because then it metastasized into something else. It metastasized into the war on drugs, into the 96 crime bill, into, into you know, welfare reform. It metastasized, it metastasized into all these things. So now we have to get our scalpel out. We have to put on our stethoscope. We have to go back in the body and we have to excise that tumor. It's a big operation, but we can do it. Yeah. And you, you break things down in such a great way. Like you paint a really clear picture. And, you know, the sense that I get after being really demoralized this year, like, you know, Bernie Sanders lost. So it felt like, man, we were this close to the White House. You know, we have COVID-19. Everything's going on. And I felt really demoralized. And I was trying to grapple with like moving forward. How do I keep going? And, you know, I I've come to realize that that's the point. Like the system is going to beat you down. But if you feel beaten down, if you feel exhausted and tired, that means that you are actually accomplishing something. You're fighting you it. that's worthwhile. Right. Exactly. It's important. So the the feeling, it's like, you know, when, when you get a good workout, when you haven't worked out in a while and your muscles are sore, that's part of the process. Not that I've been to the gym in a while, so I'll be honest there. But I mean, like, that's that's part of the process. Like, it, it's, it's important. Every movement, I think, experiences growing pains. And even if, you know, it's really easy to be bogged down, uh, you know, I, I do feel some sense of optimism buried deep, like, within my cynical heart, only because people are actually taking to the streets. And they've been in the streets. Like when I first saw the protests break out in Minneapolis, I thought, I can't believe what I'm seeing currently. I hope this lasts. And weeks later, it's still going on across the country, throughout the world. So I feel like, you know, like you said, it's such a great way to frame it. You know, the seed has been planted and now it's just a matter of what we do with it. So, I mean, all of this, it's important. What we do is important. But at the end of the day, we do have to elect people into institutions who have the power to make that change, which is where your campaign comes along. So again, June 23rd is when um, this election takes place. Uh, there's a lot of elections coming up. I mean, Jamal Bowman, uh, we have AOC's re-election, which he's going to define. I know those folks, literally, like I can call them now. I know Jamal, I know the folks running in New York 15, 5, 16, 14, 10, 12. Most of us are brand new Congress members. So we've all, we're all on that same slate. So we literally have met each other, know each other, talk all the time. You know what I mean, and it's if, even if only one of us gets through, that's one more than there was. That's what I'm talking about with the seed that's planted. You know, what I mean, we're in a very difficult race, and COVID has thrown this whole thing through a loop. But one, I don't think that the the, the systematic racism is going to go away tomorrow. So there's always going to be another opportunity to fight the next day, the next day, the next day. And two, like you said earlier. You're, if you're not if you're not in pain, if you're not feeling beat down, then you're not trying. Because guess what? There are a lot of folks out there who aren't in pain because they're not paying attention. They don't give a damn. It's not on their radar. 
But the fact that you feel dejected or I feel dejected, think about this. Even when the stock market closes at 5 o'clock, companies are still trading. They're still deciding what communities to carve up. They're still Police are still buying weapons. They're still, they're still sending folks at, at 5 o'clock. Police still going out there to patrol black and brown communities. So the fight doesn't stop just because we're tired. You know what I mean? I can give up when I'm dead. That's when I can give up. Until then, I can't give up because I understand what I'm fighting for. And somebody like me who was willing to die because America asked me to, I don't take these things lightly. The only thing I've ever quit in my life is smoking. And that's the only thing I'll ever quit. That's perfect. I like that. Okay, tell us what we can do to help your campaign because, you know, we can't just ask people to knock on doors for you now because of this pandemic. And, you know, New York is one of the first states that was really hit hard. So how can we get you elected? I mean, we have a few days left, but we can still really, we can make this happen. So what do we do um, if we live in New York or outside of the state? How can we help you? If you live in New York, you could go to IsaiahForCongress.com and sign up to phone bank with us. We so far in the last two weeks, we've made almost 100,000 calls to voters and sent almost uh, sent almost 70, 80,000 texts. We're trying to do a big push to make another 100,000 calls literally before the election, even up until Election Day. So you can sign up to phone bank or you know, knock on some doors. We are doing literature drops at some of the essential businesses that are open, putting up posters and flyers around the community. Um, I really feel weird asking folks for money because people out there are hurting. But if you do have a spare dollar or five dollars to donate, you know, you can go to IsaiahForCongress.com and there's the Act Blue donation link in there. Follow me on social media and help share the message because the more people we get our message, the reason I'm on this show is because somewhere my message got to you and you reached out to me and we and we got on this show that's how grassroots is that's why it's literally called grassroots because the roots spread you know what i mean so if folks out there can donate or sign up the phone bank or text bank or anything like that follow me on social media all that stuff will help us get over the finish line because anybody who tells you they know how this race is going to go they a damn lie nobody yeah. knows how this is going to go because coronavirus just threw everything through a loop so we have a puncher's chance just like everybody else in this race yeah and you know when you doubt the underdog sometimes you know um you get surprised um I, i'm I bite you in the ass. <laughs> yeah i i'm really really um i feel hopeful um about this election coming up um there's a lot of races to look out for and we will absolutely be watching because um uh if if you win I'm gonna lose it. I'm gonna I'm gonna freak out. Um, but I won't be on camera, so nobody can see that. Um, is I, mean, there... listen, I haven't even thought that far. You know what I mean? I'm like, if I win, I'm like, I'm probably gonna be elected to Congress. I'll be elected to Congress. My whole life would change. But I haven't thought that far. You know, like I like my drill sergeant told me when I was a young private, nobody ever was born on the top of Mount Everest. They get there one step at a time. Yeah. So if you want to conquer that giant mountain, put in the hard work, start taking those steps. Yeah. Absolutely. Well said. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to leave us with before we go? I'll leave you with a quote that is, is a paraphrase quote. You know what I mean? For folks who have or out there disingenuous or not disingenuous, but disenchanted with our system. And it's a quote. I forget who it's by. But it says it, it goes. Socialism never took root in America, not because Americans or the proletariat see themselves as exploited but they see themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Meaning that the system is set up as such that it's the, they give you it's the, the carrot in front of, you know, the, the donkey. Instead of freedom, it's free doom. So we got to change. We have to dismantle the system and install a system that helps everyday hardworking folks. That's why I'm running. That's why I'm so grateful to be on your show. And that's why Isaiah James ain't going away. Awesome. That's what I like to hear. And I love that quote. I also do not know who that is by, but it's such a good quote. So, all right, everyone. Yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> yeah I, I don't know either. There's a lot of quotes in my head that I always refrain from using because I don't know who they're by. So I don't want to like say, oh, it was by this person. But I, I, that really is an important quote. Well, thank you so much, Isaiah. Hopefully we can catch up once you win your primary and, you know, um, talk about what we do going forward so we've been talking with isaiah james running in new york's ninth congressional district the primary takes place on june 23rd get out and vote if you are in this district